Thursday Night Football, Jets are actually one and a half point favorites at home, Houston Texans. And yeah, I think from Vegas' perspective, the Jets are essentially a below a below average team with a terrible record. And the Texans are an above average team with an excellent record. Uh, the Jets, bad situationally, kicker issues, all that. We'll probably have a new kicker, I'm imagining, by Thursday night. And no Stefan Diggs, no Nico Collins. So the Texans pretty much down to Tank Dell and then a bunch of replacement level receivers probably has something to do with it, as my cold has something to do with my Robert Sala voice here today. And I'm looking at this game. <laughs> um, I think it matters from this perspective. Number one, I want the Jets to win because I want, even if it's, com I don't like us being a complete and utter embarrassment. And, it, and I would prefer the team turning the season into something resembling respectable rather than get a higher draft pick, even though I understand the argument for taking as well. However you want to be a fan, I don't care. I'm not going to police it. But until the team is mathematically eliminated, I always root for them to win. Uh, but I, I do think beyond that, this game will be pivotal from the perspective of the ownership in the front office because the trade deadline is next Tuesday. So if the Jets get blown out and embarrassed here, that might be enough for Woody Johnson uh, to start selling and stripping the team for parts and, and seeing what you could get for the five, six veterans you have on expiring contracts that could probably garner you a day three pick. DJ Reed could maybe get you an even nicer pick if you're not planning on extending him. So, but if they win, I think going to three and six will be enough for Woody to, to want to stick it out and stick with it because just two weeks ago when they got back Reddick and they, they brought in Adams, Woody Johnson was saying, we're going to kick ass. So is he going to go from saying we're going to kick ass to, oh, it's all a failure. We're going to give up on it in three weeks. So however delusional it may be, I do think a win would would give Woody, Woody the nod to go ahead and try and stick this one out. <laughs> and what I'm looking for in this game, from the Jets' perspective, like Joe Mixon, he might run for 150 yards or whatever. But offensively, this Jets team has, only score, has not scored more than 24 points at all this season. They're the only team in the NFL who has not scored more than 24 points in a single game. And the best the Jets have looked offensively was their their loss to the Buffalo Bills, where it was Todd Downing's first game as a play caller. And we saw way more 11 personnel. We saw significantly more motion. We saw significant increase in play action. And we saw the ball being snapped with five, six, seven, eight seconds left on the play clock instead of one. There was more urgency. There was just more flow. We all watched the game. You saw it. Highest uh, output of total yards. Um, highest explosive play rate. Most first downs. Any game this season, any metric you want to use, and plus just our eye test, that was the best the offense looked all year. And then, after that game, it's like they went right back to very low motion, very little play action, and a comical battle against the play clock. So I think, and you're also seeing part of the play clock issue is Aaron Rodgers is looking over to the sideline and I've never seen this before. Now I've never seen, I, I don't know, since since Brett Favre, I've, we haven't had a quarterback with the clout that could even do this, but I've, ne I've never seen a quarterback wave off play calls, like saying, no, send something else in. I've never seen that. And then, so then the, he waves it off and a new play call comes in and then he's still going to tweak that play call motion, get everything set all the, all the way down to the last second. And it's just not a sustainable way of, at some point, offensive coordinator has to be offensive coordinator and quarterback has to be quarterback. Now, because we saw, and you might say, well, Aaron Rodgers knows better than everybody on the Jets staff. He, yeah, sure. He, he, he very well might. He, he knows more than, than you or I as well. But you don't have to be a mechanical engineer to know when I get in this car, if I press the lever on the right, it goes forward. And I press the lever on the left, it stops. And when the Jets press the, the, the lever of more motion, more play action, more 11 personnel, the offense gets better. And in Green Bay, 
the, there was a balancing act because once Rogers, once Rogers was gone, LaFleur increased all those things. So obviously LaFleur wanted more of those things, but he dialed them back because he gave his Hall of Fame quarterback some autonomy. But there's a balancing act there because LaFleur at the end of the day was still the coach. It wasn't completely Aaron Rodgers' offensive coordinating, and essentially he has an, a, two assistant offensive coaches in Todd Downing and Nate Hackett. It, it can't work that way. It can't work that way. Coaches are coaches for a reason. There's a Aaron Rodgers has has no choice but to trust Todd Downing. There, there's he is the the play caller. You have to have a play caller. He's the guy. And the the one time where he his his first time on the job, where it was just bam, this is the play call. We're gonna go with it. It worked. So <laughs> let Todd Downing cook, man. And let's get back to some of that stuff that worked. Um, we'll see what happens and go Jets.